So we're talking about brain development, and as you know, there are many ways this can get screwed up. Um, it can get screwed up by heredity, as you'll hear from, about from Matt State later. I can get screwed up by disease or environmental deprivation. And so a, way, a convenient way of conceptualizing this is that imagine that we have a number of different measures of brain maturation in different parts of the brain and so on, different processes. Uh, but these, all these processes improve with age. Um, and in the case of a developmental brain disorder, there's, it's a, a derailment, and you see an um, accumulated deficit uh, as the person matures. And the, the question that we're really interested in now is whether at the time of diagnosis, which often is in early childhood in many of these diseases or even later, can we initiate a treatment uh, that can reverse these, the consequence of the disease? So we can imagine um, conceptually three potential outcomes. And the most dismal outcome is the one illustrated on the top, and that is, is that I can only intervene in, during an early critical period. And then if you miss that period, maybe the damage has already been done in utero prior to birth, it's just too late to initiate a treatment. So that's the most pessimistic point of view. The most optimistic point of view is, is that indeed we can apply our great knowledge of neurobiology to come up with good treatments that may actually reverse the course of the disease and actually restore normal function. And probably a, a realistic possibility is the one in the middle, the hopeful scenario that we can initiate treatments that may prevent further decline. So uh, the work in my lab uh, is addressing these questions in different ways. Uh, and one of the ways we look at is a genetically defined disease called Fragile X. We've done a lot of work on that. But we're also interested in the consequences of environmental deprivation. Uh, particularly a disease called amblyopia, and I'm going to tell you about that work today. So amblyopia is a not uncommon visual disability. It affects approximately 3% of the world population, uh, and it's more prevalent in, in um, nations where there's poor pre, uh, early childhood sc uh, pediatric screening. It's just a consequence of poor quality vision during infancy and early childhood. And that poor quality could arise because the eyes aren't properly aligned at birth, so the child is seeing double. Uh, it can arise because there's a dense cataract in one eye or a droopy eyelid. Uh, or it could arise because there are different refractive indices in the two eyes, so you can't focus an image on both eyes at the same time. The consequence is the same, and it is usually a fairly severe visual impairment in one of the eyes. Now, if that, if that um, optical abnormality or what have you is corrected uh, very early in life, there's a good chance to see some recovery of function. But if that correction is, occurs later, there's a very dismal prognosis. So luckily, um, there are animal models for this amblyopia. And in fact, every uh, mammal with binocular vision will show a susceptibility to poor quality visual experience during early life. Uh, and I'm going to show you a cat video. It's always popular, um, <laughs> to uh, illustrate the visual disability uh, in a kitten. Uh, so what we're looking at is, uh, that's the top of a kitten's head, um, and this kitten had been deprived of normal vision through one eye for only seven days, uh, at about the fourth postnatal week, and then that eye was unpatched, and then now we're going to measure the consequences. And first, we're going to measure the vision through the good eye, uh, and the way we do this, and I say we, it'd be very liberal, this is actually work done by Donald Mitchell, a collaborator of mine at Dalhousie University. And Don's been studying this for many, many years. But he puts the animal in a, in a box on a jack stand, and the animal learns to jump down onto a placard with the vertical stripes. So the animal's reporting whether it can resolve the stripes by choosing the correct placard to jump on, and it gets a pat on the back and a little bit of kitten food and they're very happy to, to uh, perform this task. So first we're going to look at a kitten performing the task um, through the good eye, the eye that had not been deprived. And you can see they're quite keen to do this. They jump down, they find the right stripes, get a little liverwurst. <laughs> I 
and they can make the stripes closer and closer to get a measurement of visual acuity. So this is a way that they can determine how well the animal can resolve visual stimuli the same way you would at the, at the eye doctor. So now this is the same animal, but now we're gonna do the same, this test through the eye that had been only temporarily deprived of vision, only for seven days. And what you're gonna see is this is a very severe visual impairment. So the, the good eye is being occluded with a black contact lens. So the kitten's forced to look through its lazy eye. And you can see that uh, it's having great difficulty in, in even seeing a, the stripes versus the empty chamber there. So it's a significant visual disability. And as I said, this is a type of dis disability that affects up to 3% of the human population. The visual disability will persist even when the eye has been reopened and the animal is allowed to see through both eyes. And um, this is shown in, in this graph where we're, this is now a plot of the visual acuity, the ability of the animal to resolve those stripes as a function of time after the eye has been opened, the bad eye has been opened. And the green, the green symbols show vision through the non-deprived eye and the blue symbols show the vision through the deprived eye. So you can see that although there is some, a slight recovery, there's not much, and there's a, a actually fairly severe visual disability compared to the vision through the good eye. So this uh, model of temporary monocular deprivation has been around for over 50 years, and many others, probably maybe hundreds of others, of other scientists have been studying this very intensively, and we've actually learned quite a bit about the mechanisms that serve this um, disruption in the cortex. And yet, our, our work has had very little impact on how the clinical management of amblyopia. So the question that I want to address today is, can the understanding of the synaptic basis for amblyopia suggest novel treatments to promote recovery that are better than current standard of care? And the simple answer to that question is yes. Here it is. So these are kittens that were uh, visually impaired in one eye, stable visual disability, and a treatment was initiated based on principles of synaptic plasticity uh, at this age. This is now two months after the, the uh, deprived eye had been opened, so about three months of age. And you can see that there's a very rapid recovery of vision through the deprived eye, so essentially curing this form of, of visual disability. So hopefully I've gotten your attention with this amazing result, and now I'm gonna unpack it for you and tell you what that magical treatment was. But to do so, I need to walk you through a little bit of background, which is um, the uh, visual system um, of ma by mammals with two eyes, um, often the kittens or mice or monkeys. And the visual pathway originates with these retinal ganglion cells in the two eyes. They project centrally. They relay in the lateral geniculate nucleus, or LGN. And then they go on and synapse on neurons and primary visual cortex. So when, nor when visual experience is normal through the two eyes, those connections mature, and we, we, we have binocular vision. When there's an imbalance in vision through the two eyes, it sets in motion a, a stereotype choreography of synaptic changes where the inputs carrying information from the deprived eye are weakened, and the inputs carrying information by the open eye are, are eventually show a compensatory strengthening. So we can measure these consequences of that anatomical plasticity uh, functionally as well. So we can put a microelectrode in primary visual cortex, and we can record the activity that's evoked by stimulation of the right eye or the left eye. So that's, I just direct your attention to these histograms on the top. So this is now, the number of nerve impulses uh, triggered in response to stimulation of the right eye and the left eye prior to any deprivation. So you can see this is a neuron that responds happily to stimulation of both eyes. In fact, there's a slight ocular dominance, slight preference for stimulation of the right eye. And now this right eyelid is closed, and then the neuron is recorded again later. And what you can see is it's essentially lost all responsiveness to stimulation of the eye that had been deprived. So no wonder the kittens can't see. We've disconnected the cortex uh, from that eye. So I mentioned that um, it is possible to correct uh, these visual disabilities if you intervene early enough. And the tr current standard of care is a therapy called patching therapy. And essentially that uh, comprises putting a patch, and usually an opaque patch, over the strong eye to force the weak eye to uh, function. And that can be successful. So when you patch the strong eye, you'll get a recovery of vision through the weak eye. Now there are a number of limitations of this approach. 
uh, not least of which is compliance, because children don't like to have these eye patches. Um, but also, there is uh, the gains in the um, amblyopic eye often come at the expense of the good eye, because you're now patching it. Uh, there's little improvement in binocular vision, so no stereopsis. And again, it's only effective if you initiate this treatment prior to age eight or so. So what do we, let's get under the hood and see what happens during reverse patching. Well, uh, so again, we're recording now from a single neuron in primary visual cortex. Uh, this is the situation, we're gonna start with a situation after a period of monocular deprivation. So we have a neuron here that's responding only to the left eye. There's no response to the right eye. That's because we've, we've already performed a monocular deprivation. So the kitten is amblyopic. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna patch the strong eye, and we're gonna open the weak eye and see what happens. And what happens is, is that initially you get a loss of responsiveness to the newly deprived eye, but with time, you start to gain a gain of responsiveness in the, um, non the formerly deprived, now seeing eye. So this is good, we can get, a, re we can get a, a recovery, but it's not ideal. It's not ideal because it actually is a zero sum game. So the gains that we're getting in this weak, lazy eye are coming at the expense of the strong eye. And as in the case of patching therapy in uh, humans, uh, this reverse patching in the animal models also shows a sensitive period. So this is a classic study done by Blakemore and Van Sliders in cats, showing that the ability to reverse this ocular dominance shift or this uh, change in physiology in the cortex diminishes greatly with age, so that by eight weeks of age, it's very difficult to get a reversal, and it's essentially gone by 12 to 14 weeks of age. And the same sort of pattern is seen in, in any species that's been looked at. So uh, there are problems with patching therapy, but these limitations notwithstanding, they do demonstrate that we can rejuvenate weak synapses. We can rejuvenate these inputs that previously were incapable of evoking a response. So what we'd like to do is understand that process a little bit better so that maybe we can devise a better way to restore function. So to understand where we're gonna go, I have to introduce some of the simple principles of synaptic plasticity. So the excitatory synapses in our brains use glutamate as a neurotransmitter. Glutamate activates two types of postsynaptic glutamate receptor, glutamate-gated ion channels. Uh, the AMPA receptor mediates fast synaptic transmission, and the NMDA receptor uh, is an important trigger for modification of synaptic strength. And so what we've learned over 30 or 40 years of intensive effort uh, is that we can indeed modify the strength of synaptic transmission, and we do so by activating NMDA receptors. Uh, so strong activation of NMDA receptors will make a synapse stronger, and that's a phenomenon we call long-term potentiation, or LTP. Uh, modest activation of NMDA receptors leads to the reversed form of plasticity called long-term depression, or LTD. And the NMDA receptor has an unusual property that's actually very sensitive to how well correlated pre- and postsynaptic neurons are. So strongly correlated activity strongly activates NMDA receptors, and you're more likely to get a synaptic strengthening. So this is one fundamental feature of what we call bidirectional synaptic plasticity. Another fundamental feature is, is that that learning rule actually is also modifiable. So if uh, neurons are quieted for a long period of time, there's a shift in this function. So for example, the function will shift to the left. If we put animals in the dark, for instance, this function will shift to the left in visual cortex, which has the net effect of making the potentiation more readily um, observed and making depression more difficult. So we call that property uh, metaplasticity. It's a type of homeostatic plasticity to make sure the network of synapses uh, keeps within a dynamic range. So now, how are we going to explain this uh, effective reverse patching? So let's go through this again. We have a situation where we have a, a neuron that responds only to stimulation of one eye. This eye has been functionally disconnected. And now we're going to close that strong eye. And the first thing that happens is that the neuron stops, loses responsiveness to the newly deprived eye. So this is believed to be a consequence of these mechanisms of long-term depression. In fact, there's very, very good evidence to support that statement. So this initial loss of responsiveness is due to a diminution of 
the strength of excitatory synaptic transmission from inputs carrying information by that eye. But something else has happened as well. The other thing that's happened is imagine we have a situation where the seeing eye is not strong enough to evoke a response, and the strong eye is not seeing. So as a consequence, the activity in the cortex falls, and this is the condition required to induce this metaplasticity. So eventually what we see is, is that the change in the rules of the game, so this function will slide to the left, and this will allow the recovery of the uh, formerly deprived, now seeing eye. It can recover because it's got reasonable, reasonably correlated activity. It was very weak, and now this weak activity is enough to start to gain a toehold and drive those synapses up. So I mentioned that there are issues with patch therapy. Um, it's, it's not ideal, and the question is, can we use these principles of metaplasticity to restore function without resorting to patching? Well, there is good reason to believe that that's the case. Um, first, there have been an, a couple of studies done um, by others where they've put animals into complete darkness after a period of monocular deprivation. Um, so literally a, one or two weeks of complete darkness, uh, and then the animals are brought back into the light with both eyes open, and what they've observed is they can get a recovery of vision. It could be quite dramatic. But it does require weeks of darkness, and you, that darkness cannot be interrupted even temporarily by light exposure. So we wondered if we could do better, again, based on what we knew about this metaplasticity property. So the experiment that we did was to use an anesthetic and inject both eyes uh, with this anesthetic. It's an anesthetic called tetrodotoxin. But really, any, any drug that would block sodium-dependent action potentials would work. So essentially what we're doing is, in essence, we're rebooting the visual system. We are turning it off, and then we're going to let it turn back on again. So the, the, the rationale here is, is that we put this tetrodotoxin into the eyes, and we block all impulse activity. This curve slides to the left, and this will promote the recovery of the uh, weak input. So what happens? Well, I wouldn't be telling you this if it didn't work. Uh, <laughs> works beautifully, it works amazingly, amazingly. So uh, this is work from mice here, so I have to introduce a little bit. Essentially, the only thing that matters is that the blue bars represent the strength of one eye, the, the eye on the opposite side of the head, the contralateral eye, and the yellow bar represents the strength of the, of the other eye, the ipsilateral eye. So if you don't do anything to a mouse, uh, these, the heights of these bars wax and wane, but they don't change too much. If you monocularly deprive a mouse, as we've done here, it goes from th here where we've closed the blue eye, so this response is depressed, and it stays depressed. Okay, it never recovers spontaneously. But if we follow that monocular deprivation with this bilateral injection of tetrodotoxin to turn the eyes off, when the TTX wears off, we see a rapid recovery of vision through the deprived eye. So this is the magic treatment that we did in the kittens. Um, so in these animals, uh, tetrodotoxin was injected bilaterally. In this case, we did two uh, injections into the both eyes because we didn't want to take any chances. But you can see which is a really remarkable recovery of, of sight. And then this is uh, an example of one experiment where initially we failed. Uh, we failed because the injections weren't successful and they didn't block the pupillary light reflex, so we knew we hadn't blocked impulse activity. Um, we were disappointed, animal uh, kept maturing, we wondered what we were going to do with it. We said, oh, let's try it again. So we tried it again, uh, now at the ripe old age of five months, uh, single injection of TTX, and again, we saw this great recovery. So we're excited about that because it's a brief manipulation, even very late. And just to compare, this is five months of age, or 20 weeks, and you can see that's way beyond what's possible with reverse occlusion. So just to wrap up. We're seeing recovery uh, at older ages than it's possible with reverse occlusion. The recovery is very rapid, occurs over the course of a week. It's 100% complete. And the recovery of the weak eye does not come at the expense of the strong eye. So, of course, what we want to know now is precisely how did this retinal activation work? And can we, can we actually translate this knowledge into better therapies for human amblyopia? And with that, I'll just thank the people who did all the work and our funding sources.
Thank you.